Here are a few political cliches you've probably heard recently. The rich control an increasingly large piece of the economic pie, and they aren't paying their fair share. If we increase taxes, our economy will become uncompetitive like France. So, are you paying too much and getting too little in return? Or are the 1% paying too little and widening the gap between rich and poor? It's our subject tonight, the US tax code from Charlotte, North Carolina. This is the business of life. Michael Moynihan, and welcome to The Business of Life, coming to you this week from Charlotte, North Carolina. An anecdote for you, I once covered an election in a European country, one with a very generous welfare state, in which the conservative candidate vowed to not lower taxes. Things are different here in the United States. It's a national sport to complain about taxes, for presidential candidates to promise tax cuts, and for us regular citizens to hate the sinister IRS. But look at opinion polls. We say that we want lower taxes and smaller government, but we also demand a generous government. So, should the rich pay more, or are we already overburdened with local, state, and federal taxes? Well, today we're gonna find out. And as always, we'll break down the issue using facts, figures, and dollars and cents. I'm joined by a panel of experts clamoring to answer the question, should we change the US tax code? Let's meet them. Ben Castleman is the chief economics writer for 538.com, where he writes about taxes, income inequality, and education. He was previously a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Lee Shepard is a contributing editor at Tax Notes and was recently named one of the 50 most influential players in international taxation by International Tax Review. There's a lot of tax in it. And by the way, the New York Times said that uh, you res resemble a nostalgic, if high-end, punk rock groupie. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. they, said, they said that about you. All right, well, one more thing. There are two people in this panel. Um, we usually have three. But because of the weirdness of airlines and the vicissitudes of weather and things like that, we're missing one. And one is somewhere in the air. But she might come. And when she does, we're going to welcome her with open arms, and we're going to seat her at the panel, and she's going to jump into it. But we're going to jump into it right now. So let's begin with our first topic, paying your taxes something that all of you, I hope, are doing. And our first number, 90%. That's the amount of taxes owed that the US government collected in 2010. In Greece, poor Greece, that number was just 53%. Why is our tax rate sort of you know, nice compared to these crazy well, European choices. Comparisons to Europe are tricky, right? Because in general, the countries are vastly smaller, right? Yes. They tend to be, especially the Nordic countries where they have a really strong welfare state, those tend to be very homogenous countries, right? Trying to in instill that system in a country of 300 million people, a very diverse country, a much younger country in yes. terms of, of age of our citizens. So the number that you put up here about Greece versus the U.S. and paying taxes, I actually think is really interesting because in addition to the tax systems being different, then within Europe, you have a few countries like Italy and especially like Greece where people don't pay the taxes, right? They have high rates of tax, but they don't pay them. And I think what's critical to understand there is once that starts, it becomes very difficult to reverse, right? If everybody pays their taxes and you don't, then you're a freeloader. Yeah. If nobody pays their taxes and you do, you're then a you're a sucker. The two significant events for us in taxes are Vietnam and going off the gold standard, but also Reagan. Reagan, before a lot of these audience were born, told the middle class in America that they were overtaxed. They weren't. They aren't. You know, they're, they, they, they're getting, not even paying for the full set of government's benefits that they're getting. But uh, this was believed and it changed the tax landscape forever. And fundamentally, if you don't believe that your tax system is fair, you're a lot less likely to pay your taxes. And so when we start to hear now people saying, oh, the rich aren't paying their fair share, I'm overtaxed, I think you could start to see people saying, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just being a freeloader here, I'm paying only what I owe. Let's look at this next number. 0 0.01 cents, that's the added tax on soda sold in Berkeley, California, as passed by a 2014 ballot initiative. The amount the beverage industry spent to fight the initiative $238 per vote. They weren't successful. Has anyone actually done that? 
Does anyone change behavior because of some tax on something? You have? Yeah, I bought a Prius um, because gas taxes here were higher than where I grew up in South Carolina. And I was like, oh, this has saved me a lot of money. Over time, it's been saving me like $5,000 versus the old car that I had. This is the concept of nudge, of nudging people's behavior, not banning things, nudging people through taxation out of bad behaviors. Does it work and should we do it? In Mexico, they are taxing junk foods and things like that. It is working. It will work if you've got like uh, people, who's, people who are operating at tighter margins. Like $14 a pack is not gonna stop a well-off person from smoking. The main reason you wanna be doing this kind of a tax is, is, is behavior modification, not revenue. Well, if, if you're is... getting revenue, you're, you're doing something wrong. We tax labor. Right? Yeah. We tax hiring. We tax a lot of things that we don't want to discourage. Now, we, you're not going to be able to replace the income tax with the cigarette tax, right? Not enough people smoke. You're not going to be able to raise enough money that way. But all taxes work this way. They discourage yeah. whatever it is that they're taxing. And it's important to start thinking about taxes in that way. You got to get a little paternalistic when you're running a government. You know, you got to basically say, look, you know, I don't want you riding without a helmet because, you know, you're, you're going to die. And, and, th there are and costs, you impose right? I mean, costs <laughs> on society. And we want to save people from themselves, too. All right, let's look at this next number. 102 million, that's the total amount the state of Colorado has collected in taxes, fees, and licenses on a marijuana since June of 2014. And by way of comparison, the annual amount the state of Texas collects from undocumented workers, $1.6 billion. This strikes me as a kind of small number, $102 million. Because the taxes are high, does this actually put dealers out of business? Because they don't have to pay taxes. If you buy it straight from people who were selling it before, there's numbers that show that you buy marijuana from your old dealer, it's cheaper. But your old dealer is technically liable for federal income taxes and things like that. I mean, I have a person shaking his head. The criminal activity is not taxable. It is taxable. It's in our tax code. Really, <laughs> it don't is. Look, don't look at me. I don't. And we had an absolutely wonderful case in the United States tax court where the, the IRS had tried to tax a dealer on his gross income, That's and he right. went to court and proved up his costs. And the tax court said, okay, fine, you can deduct your costs. And then Congress had to change the law to say that drug dealers can't deduct their costs. Let's <laughs> vocalize the head shake. Well, uh, the reason I was shaking my head because uh, not, that's not quite the way drug dealing works. I'm not sure <laughs> they're worried about, oh, the feds are going to get me for tax. And I know that's what Al Capone and a lot of drug dealers go for, but I'm not sure that's on the high list of priorities. Ah, oh, the feds are going to give me for taxes. Tax comes in. I mean, it doesn't come in at the front end because people who are dealing are not paying their taxes, but at the back end, yeah, that's, it's on the charge sheet, and a lot of times it's the only one that goes. I think you're right. That nobody's actually worrying about this, but the response is they probably should be. But a guy making money on the side who has a job maybe selling $20,000 worth of weed a year can he not hide that a little more discreetly Ooh, but, than... But now you're just I'm asking not, for advice. Not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that says if you can hide it doesn't mean it's taxable, you know? So, it, the law does say that all, all, you know, income is taxable. So one of the interesting challenges now as it's starting to be legalized is how do you set the, the taxing, right? Because if you tax at 100%, right, you double the price, people are going to keep going to the black market, right? They'd rather, you know, that it's cheaper. But people will probably be willing to pay a little bit more to be confident they're not going to get in. They're not going to get in trouble, right? So the, the question is like, what is that? You don't need to. Ta you don't need to bring tax at zero. You don't. Need to, you can't tax it 100 percent, 200 percent. Where's that level? And, and nobody knows right now. Let's look at this next number. 104 pages. It's the length of instructions to the 1040 form this year. In 1940, two pages. That's a lot. That's right? a lot. So. Here's what happens in politics, and you know this. Everybody, left, right, and center, Democrat, Independent, Republican, from Bernie Sanders to Ted Cruz, I could probably get them to say we should simplify the tax code. Why does it not happen? For most of you, and for me, the tax system is not that complicated. The average person who fills out a 1040 EZ spends five hours in the whole year doing their taxes. That includes the time collecting the records, all the rest of it. The reason it's complicated in part, not exclusively, but in part, is because TurboTax is lobbying to keep it that way. Well, but also we deliberately overwithhold. 
because for, for most regular people, you know, your tax form is put the W-2 number here, sign it at the bottom, here's your refund, and your refund is quite a high number. It's like the reward for filing this form. Every time somebody tells you how excited they are about their refund, yeah. you just gave a tax, an interest-free loan. loan to the yeah. government for the past year. You're just like three. ruining all my fun. I find out that like TurboTax is running the world and that I'm just giving the government things You invite for free. an economics writer and a tax person yeah, here. No, no, like, this, we're is, gonna yeah, this is sort of trouble, what happens, yeah. isn't it? Well, I have a sort of complimentary number here and let's look at this next number. 83.9%. That's the total share of income taxes paid by the top fifth of US wage earners in 2014. The share paid by the bottom fifth, negative 2.2%. And it's not really paid, obviously, because they're getting things back. Who is sort of broadly aware that, that this was true? Yeah? I, 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 like, if you take the top, like, 1%, what percentage of the entire sort of tax revenue are they paying? Okay, high salaried pay a lot, okay? They don't account for all of the 1%. There are a lot of high salaried executives in the 1% paying a lot of tax on those salaries. But in the 1%, you also have people who live off wealth, who live off capital gains and tax-exempt bonds and get all those various benefits we have for investments. And some of them are not paying a whole lot. This is like Warren Buffett saying, I'm paying a lower rate than my secretary. There's a whole lot of special rates for investment type -y things. But the salaried people, yeah, those, the high salaried pay a bundle. First of all, the top 20% of earners pay 80% of taxes. But the top 20% also earn 50% of the money. Secondly, this is federal income tax. Right? Our, the rest of our tax code is a lot less progressive than that. And when you lump in state and local, many of those taxes are pretty regressive or it certainly aren't progressive like the income tax system. It ends up getting a lot closer to their share of income. And we do still have a progressive tax system. That's sort of built into our whole notion. But it, it's not, this 2080 makes it sound like a much bigger disconnect. Can it possibly be that no, you know, if the tax rate goes up to 90% or 80%, that this doesn't have an effect on, no. on, on growth and that I, doesn't I have an effect on the job market and labor market or all sorts of these other things. There is a big difference between the way that we, we tax a doctor who makes a lot of money, a, a lawyer who makes a lot of money, right, but it's still sort of this normal income that gets taxed at, you know, a, a top rate of almost 40%. And a investment manager who gets paid probably much, much more money. Yeah. And this is how Buffett can make less than his secretary. I, I want to say that this woman has endured something that I would never wish upon my worst enemy. Let's give her a huge round of applause. <laughs> Dorothy A. Brown is a professor of law at Emory University and a nationally recognized scholar in tax policy and has published extensively on the racial implications of federal tax policy. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm so, delighted to be here. Let's move on to our second topic, not paying your taxes. And let's uh, bring up this first number. And again, like the first one, we're not advising you not to pay your taxes. Uh, $250,000, that's the price of a St. Kitts and Nevis passport. The tax rate on income and capital gains in St. Kitts and Nevis, zero. Can I ask the audience, does anyone currently pay taxes in another country? Anyone? Has anyone actually at some time in their life paid taxes in another country? No. The guy who created this company, he created a company to get you passports for St. Kitts and Nevis. By the way, very nice, St. Kitts is very nice. $2 billion in one year selling passports. $2 billion, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. But a lot of people go in a lot of different places, a lot of tax competition. Are we losing a ton of money? We are not losing as much as the Europeans are losing from this, either on the individual side or the corporate side. Our tax code says that business income that you earned in a foreign country, you don't have to pay U.S. tax on it right off the bat. The U.S. income from the same business earned in the United States, you have to pay tax on it. The big reason the you went too, is labor costs. Yeah. But why are we rewarding companies for doing something that we don't really want them to do? This is where I get to make the argument that's really popular among economists and really unpopular among everybody else, All right. which is that we shouldn't have corporate taxes. Mm -hmm. And, Ooh, right, yeah. so this is, we no, all get no, to, no, no. so corporate profits, right, one of two things is going to happen with that. Either it gets invested into, into the company, right, to hire more people, to expand the business, or it gets given back to shareholders, and we should be taxing them, right? Yeah. If you want to tax rich people, don't tax rich people by taxing companies, tax rich people. There are so many loopholes, but we do have one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world, right? 
But, but very few but companies here, okay. pay it. Yes. So we have this high, this high rate on paper that then companies don't pay, but it's not like it's evenly distributed That's who doesn't right. pay it. Isn't. The it big right. companies, they don't pay taxes. They may pay zero taxes yeah. in many cases. Yeah. And then the mom and pop businesses end up paying more tax. They pay that high rate, which is the yeah. argument again for why get rid of the corporate tax and tax it at the, at the, uh, the, the dividend level. All right, let's look at our next number. Two-fifths of Americans do not pay any income tax whatsoever, and uh, two in three Americans pay more in payroll tax than they do in federal income tax. What's going on? Explain this to us. It's called the Earned Income Tax Credit, but but they have heard about it. Remember Mitt Romney's 47 percent? Yeah. They may have dismissed it, but that actually was an accurate number. Yeah. Be, I know you, you heard it you're, here first. You're, you're, okay, so you, Mitt, Rom, Mitt, Romney Mitt Romney was, was right. right about one thing. 47 percent. There's a lot of people who don't pay tax. Right now, now it's 40 percent. Now it's 40 percent because of the Earned Income Tax Credit, which was designed to compensate low-income workers for the level of social security taxes they pay, as well as the income taxes. So the next figure that talked about two thirds, that talks about social security taxes are huge on low income wage earners. Right. Yeah, so they're not escaping like no. without paying taxes. You know who these 40% are, right? Two thirds of them are paying, are paying payroll taxes, yeah. right? Most of the rest are retirees, Yeah. right? They don't have much income coming in. And then the, the only people who are left over are the genuinely poor. But is this balance right? I would like everybody to be with us with a, with a wage to be in the income tax, even for a penny. I don't want high taxes on them, but I want them to be in for a penny because that's the relationship with government. That's, they have a stake in the spending. I don't agree with this. If you're poor, you need that penny. You don't need the government to have that penny. That's why we have the Earned Income Tax Credit. It's to reward work, but to not make it so onerous. The percentage of Earned Income Tax Credit recipients who use tax return preparers is higher than the rest of us because it's that freaking complicated. Yeah, and it's, it's an interview. Still, yeah, Roughly 25 percent of people uh, who qualify for the earned income tax credit don't take it. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that not a political winner, by but, the way? But, but, to say, let's be careful by at because least this. Because what it replaced, we repealed welfare, okay? We, we shrank it, and what we're doing is we're delivering social, financial type benefits through the tax code. There's a GAO study that looked at what happened to EITC returns when it got to the IRS. What is EITC returns? Earned income tax credit. Okay, I just see you lost me there. I'm like, oh, it I'm just sorry. became an acronym. And Earned income just... tax credit <laughs> yeah. that looked at what happened once it got to the IRS, looked at what happened when somebody who had a tax return preparer did it, looked at what happened when you didn't have a tax return preparer, and they found everybody screwed it up. Everybody. The IRS, the taxpayer, and the tax return preparer. Because it's that complicated. Let's look at this next number. $94 billion is the reported profits of U.S. corporate subsidiaries in Bermuda. Bermuda's GDP in 2012, $5.5 billion. Now, the London Times, uh, about four or five months ago, did a series of front page stories on a number of very famous British people. Uh, they were singers, they were these uh, boy band idiots that make lots of money. <laughs> of them were, were cheating on their taxes and they were using this kind of interesting language. But what was acknowledged in every piece is what they were doing was legal. Do you want to get back to the corporations or talk about the boy bands? Because I it, like both topics. Cheating, look, cheating your taxes in Britain is a lot easier than it is from the United States, okay? The items that's specific to Bermuda is reinsurance income. Our law allows that. We have an excise tax on, on the premiums. The real concern is the big companies that put intellectual property in holding companies that are paper companies in Bermuda, and then they pay profits uh, from all over the world into Bermuda as royalties. The United States is not particularly upset if it's an American company and the profits are coming out of the rest of the world and they're not paying much tax to the rest of the world. All right, let's bring up this uh, next number, $5.8 billion. This is the amount the IRS paid out in fraudulent refunds in 2013. You also see that the amount that they prevented in fraud totals $24.2 billion. I mean, that's a ton of money. Who's, who's doing this? Well, the $24.2 billion folks, they're not doing it that well, right? Because they're getting caught pretty, yeah. pretty easily. The 5.8, on the other hand, you know, they're kind of clever. That's who we should follow. Yeah. Right? And part of the problem is Congress has taken away money that would enable the IRS to go after more fraudulent returns. So the miracle is, given the little they have to work with, that they caught $24.2 billion.
the IRS collects something like one and a half trillion dollars in income tax, right? So five point eight billion dollars in fraud. Now I guarantee you, there's so is that actually is that actually a low number? I, that's Relative. not very much, right? That's, that's, a, yeah. that's a low percentage. Yeah. And, you know, I do think that that gets back to the, where we started, right, about Americans basically paying the taxes that they're owed. We do have that cultural expectation, and I think that if we erode the sense of fairness, then there'll be a lot more people who try to get away with one because they won't see it as an ethical problem. They might be concerned about the legal repercussions, but most people who pay their taxes aren't really doing it because they think they're going to get caught. 90% of what we collect, we withhold from wages. On wages. And we fight about the other 10%. But should we be taking deductions? I actually would like to get rid of almost all deductions, let me be clear, all deductions, and pretty much all exclusions, and bring the tax rate down, maybe 10%. Why would you want to bring the tax pay rate down 10%? I want this? more money in people's hands to spend how they want to spend. For example, two-thirds of Americans do not itemize deductions. They take the standard deduction. Why do we have itemized deductions for one-third? Who takes deductions? It is, right. It, higher income It's higher income people. And most of Members those... Members of Congress. Yeah. A lot yeah. of those deductions <laughs> are... A lot of those deductions are also distortionary in different ways, right? We encourage people to buy bigger homes than they really need. We don't tax employer-provided health insurance, right? Which then or encourages... Pensions. Or pensions which encourages companies to divert more money in that direction rather than in putting cash in your pocket. Does anyone want to tell me what they think constitutes rich? What do you think uh, sort of constitutes rich? I think rich is somebody who has over a million dollars. So you wouldn't say somebody that, that makes a salary of $300,000 a year, you wouldn't say that they were a rich person? I wouldn't say that they were rich, but I would say they definitely have money. I'm surprised by this. I think that's a lot of money. I'm this getting underpaid for this show. This is why I'm, I'm walking off right now. I want to <laughs> raise, I want to raise <laughs> vice. Have no this is why politicians <laughs> like to talk in percentages, yeah. right? So the top 5%, right, the cutoff there is about $200,000. Yeah. Right, the top one percent is is more like four hundred fifty thousand. Right, top two percent I think is somewhere around three hundred. When you talk about taxing the one percent or taxing the five percent, you're going to hit a lot of people who think of themselves yeah, as, as not rich, rich as, as upper middle class, as affluent. Right, and the people in this room think of that way. But here's the reality. If you want to lower tax on the middle class or you want to really raise a lot of money, you have to hit those people. You can't do it just taxing the 0.01, the, the, yeah. the millionaire, yeah. billionaire no. type. The one-tenth of one percent, yeah. the truly rich. Yeah. And that's how much? Multi-millions. Yeah. Half of Americans in households Below less that. than 50, half over 50. Yeah. So this million dollars, it's 100,000. Hat, median $50,000. I'm rich again. Okay. Yeah, rich again. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, actually. <laughs> large salaries, large wealth is earned in high-tax places. It's earned in, uh, it's earned on the coasts in this country. It's earned in Europe. Let's get to this next number, which um, sort of feeds into that. 67%, that's the number of Americans who want a budget that, quote, closes corporate tax loopholes and limits tax breaks for the wealthy. That 67% really don't have much to say about it when there's, there's, large companies and, and, and rich people, you know, lobbying Congress all the time. We know that most individual political... You, this is a bipartisan thing, you're saying? Yes, it's totally bipartisan. I don't agree with that. I don't... Because I'll give one example. You want to talk about tax breaks for the wealthy? The estate tax, or what the Republicans call the death tax. You've got a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate. You're not even talking about repealing the estate tax. So here's why I think the, the estate tax ends up being such a significant issue, and I think it really speaks to what everybody was talking about when they were asked, what is rich? And listen to what people said. They mostly pointed not to an income. They pointed to an amount of money that they have, right? If you've got a million dollars, if you've got five million dollars, we recognize that what makes you rich is not how much money you made this year, it's how wealthy you are. And the estate tax, right, that is what ensures that if my daddy was rich, then I'm likely to be rich too. But a big piece of that is he can hand me his money with very little tax, even under our current estate tax right. system, very little of that ends up getting taxed. Yeah. You know, this is a lot to take in. Um, you know, it's a very, very divisive issue. I I've looked around and I have seen an audience that is nodding vigorously, that is shaking their heads vigorously and kind of like pouting too. So let's get to you and uh, have you ask your questions to the panelists and uh, comments. You know, Michael, we always hear about these fat cats on Wall Street taking all the tax breaks. I'm interested to know, are there any tax breaks that are happening for the families of working class citizens? Itemized deductions, mortgage interest, charitable contributions, 
state and local income taxes. Is there a meaningful way of somebody who is in that sort of $50,000, $60,000, is there a way that they can sort of meaningful, like in a, in a significant way, shrink their tax bills? You know what you can do to reduce your tax bill if you are earning $50,000, $60,000 is you can put your money in your 401k. Retirement. And yes. that is absolutely something that you should be doing if you're lucky enough to work for a company that, that has matches. It. Yes. yes. Match the Do match. Do not leave like, money on the table. Please don't leave money on the table. Don't leave money. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I, I have never saved it to And if you can afford well, to stop that. So, I'm so Stop screwed. that right now. This, sometimes these right shows right really depress me. But it will, right in now. addition to saving for retirement, it will reduce your tax life. Absolutely. Yes. And, it's, absolutely. and it's, an, it's investment assets that, you know, you can build wealth in your retirement plan. Listen to no, this. This is a no kids. brainer. <laughs> Who else has a question? For the average person of my generation, corporate loopholes are kind of like twerking to a senior citizen where they don't really know what it is yet and they haven't really figured it out. These people probably don't want <laughs> businesses to go overseas as well. So I guess if you cut corporate loopholes, will that also in turn send businesses, businesses overseas as well? The ones that are paying zero are the ones where the centerpiece of the business is some kind of intellectual property, so that's tech and pharma, and they are able to shift income to places like Bermuda. And, and most of the income they're not paying taxes on is the foreign income. Manufacturers didn't pay a lot of taxes. Utilities don't pay a lot of taxes. I mean, we have businesses that we kind of explicitly favor, and that's not it, it, entirely a bad thing. And they will say, if you get rid of this loophole, then we'll shut down the factory, then we'll stop drilling the wells, or we'll drill them somewhere else, or we'll take this business elsewhere. And if you're a congressman, one, you don't want to lose out on the campaign donations, and two, you don't want to be the one who has to explain to your constituents why the factory closed. Yeah, and so you're terrified. You, you're terrified. All right, well, as always on The Business of Life, I come away from this uh, knowing a lot more than I went in, and I hope uh, you did too. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for helping us do that. The heroic Dorothy, Ben, and Lee. And thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Business of Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at bettermoneyhabits.com.